Well, thank you very much for your invitation to participate in this meeting. I'm greatly privileged and pleased to be able to be here this morning, and thank you also for your kind introductory words. So I, I spent most of my active life in basic research funded by the Medical Research Council. I've seen quite a lot of, uh, of uh, world-class research and also uh, attempts, at, successful attempts, to turn uh, fundamental discoveries uh, into uh, uh, financial uh, reward by the creation of companies. So I thought I'd call my talk this morning world-class research and, and innovation. And I think uh, this is a, a formula for uh, possible success. First of all, you obviously need outstanding uh, research leaders. And uh, I'm often asked, can I give advice to young scientists about how to become successful? And one of the things I tell them to do is to find somebody who is outstanding and, and uh, work with them and be influenced by them. And I've got, uh, but then uh, you need first-class facilities for carrying out basic research. And we have such facilities, particularly in medical research, uh, in, in, in this country. But if you're to be successful, you need long-term and stable funding from, from government, charities, and industry. And this, this has certainly been uh, an important factor that is well recognized in the success of the Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge, which has now been, uh, has now housed more than 12 uh, Nobel laureates. And the, the, the Medical Research Council has provided long-term and stable funding, and the effect of that has been to encourage people to undertake extremely difficult problems that would be really impossible to undertake on a five-year grant cycle. And so long-term long stable funding, I think, is very important if people are are to be given the opportunity to attack really difficult, uh, in, in fact, seemingly impossible uh, problems. Uh, once you've done your uh, basic research, of course, you have to have a will uh, to translate and patent. And during my career, I've met two kinds of people, those who are very willing and wish to translate uh, their research. There's no better example than Sir Greg Winter, uh, at, at Master of Trinity College. Um, and you really have to want uh, to translate and, and to put a lot of effort uh, in, into that. And in this period of translation, it is important uh, to, to, to have incubators uh, to, to help develop the initial uh, translation of the basic discovery. And this, this can take quite a long time. And uh, finding adequate finances uh, from venture capitalists can be really quite difficult. And so this is a, a, a crucial part uh, of the translation process. Now, I spotted this in the Wall Street Journal uh, quite recently. Innovation is a mysteriously difficult thing to dictate. Technology seems to change by a sort of inexorable evolutionary process, which we probably cannot stop or speed up much either. And it's not much the product of science. Uh, most technological breakthroughs come from technologists tinkering, not from researchers chasing hypotheses. Heretical as it may sound, basic science isn't nearly as productive of new inventions as we tend to think. Complete nonsense. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I just want to do, just give a few examples of, of basic science discoveries that led to wealth creation. Uh, they're rather obvious, uh, that I'll just mention uh, the invention of the light, light bulb, the invention of osmosis for uh, uh, desalination and the development of biotechnology, which is relevant, of course, to, to, to your discussions. So the discovery of, of electricity is generally attributed to Benjamin Franklin with his famous kite experiment during a, uh, a lightning storm and also to, to Volta, Alexandra Volta, for his experiments on, on frogs. And this basic discovery was then translated by two people independently, by Thomas Edison and by uh, Joseph Swan. And, and they're both recognized as uh, the inventors of the electric light bulb. So here's a very good example of how a basic, sci a basic scientific discovery uh, can lead to a huge multi-million dollar industry. The second example here is given by the 
discovery of osmosis by René Henri de Trochet, uh, who lived dur uh, during the period of the French Revolution. His family became impoverished by that. Uh, but he went ahead, he was interested in plants, and he discovered uh, the phenomenon of uh, osmosis uh, depicted here, which has then been uh, translated into these huge desalination plants, such as one can find, for example, uh, in California. Again, uh, a basic science discovery made in the uh, 18th and 19th century by basic scientists, leading eventually to translation and generation uh, of wealth. Now, the, the third topic, the, the one that's most relevant here, is biotechnology. So, of course, biotechnology has been around for a long time. People have fermented uh, uh, yeasts to make bread and beer from time immemorial. Uh, farmers have carried out selective breeding of animals, and Darwin was very interested uh, in this, uh, in his collections of, and studies of, of pigeons. It's also interesting that Heim Weizmann, one of the founders of Israel, uh, whilst working at the University of Manchester in 1917, used Clostridium acetobutylicum uh, to, make ac uh, to make acetone uh, for making explosives uh, in the first, first World War. And then perhaps one of the first examples of uh, modern biotechnology is the development of penicillin for medicine carried out at Oxford University uh, during this uh, wartime period. I'll come back to that in a moment. And then uh, from the 1970s onward, uh, we have, we've seen the uh, development of modern uh, biotechnology. And the, the, some of the pioneers in this area, again, were all basic scientists, Herb Boyer, uh, Stanley Cohen, and Paul Berg, Berg for the, their work on uh, demonstrating that one could recombine uh, DNA. Uh, Frederick Sanger here in Cambridge, I had the privilege of working with him for five years, invented DNA sequencing. Sanger's completely revolution, revolutionized biology. Uh, just, just think how, what the world would be like if we couldn't sequence DNA at, at, at will. Uh, Carrie Mullis invented the polymerase chain reaction, which anybody who does biological experiments will have used. And then Georges Kerler and Cesar Milstein, also at the laboratory of molecular biology, as Sanger was, uh, discovered monoclonal antibodies. Not, none of these gentlemen were really motivated by uh, thoughts of translation. They, they were all interested in specific uh, science, scientific uh, problems. Milst, Milstein was a friend and colleague of mine. He worked in the next uh, laboratory. And he was frustrated because he didn't have a ready source of pure antibodies other than proteins that are found in urine called Benz Jones proteins. And he wanted to have a way of making pure antibodies. He did not foresee when he invented monoclonal antibodies, uh, the, the, the applications that we're seeing constantly now in medicine for, for treating cancer. Um, so I thought I'd just go on to mention some, what I consider to be some of the grand challenges for science and biotechnology for the, uh, for the future. There's clearly a major issue in, in dealing with neurodegeneration. Uh, we need new antibiotics, and I want to talk a little bit about solving the energy crisis. So we're all becoming familiar with how overburdened the National Health Service is becoming as, as the population ages uh, with Parkinson's, Huntington's, Alt Alzheimer's disease. And also, uh, the, 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 there is a range of rare, uh, rarer uh, diseases and aging itself, all of which have, have a neurodegenerative uh, component uh, in them. Um, you, you, familiar, I'm sure, with, with Parkinson's disease. It's caused by a loss um, of neurons from the substantia nigra in, in the midbrain. And these are the uh, symptoms uh, associated with it. Now, there are familial forms of Parkinson's disease. So most Parkinson's disease is sporadic and presumably is influenced by environmental factors. But there are familial forms and they've been studied extensively at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda. Uh, and it has been found that, uh, that the, the disease is linked to a dysfunction uh, in mitochondria. So in, in your cells, there is, a, there is a procedure for surveying whether the mitochondria are functional or dysfunctional. 
If they're dysfunctional, they become marked by ubiquitination, and then they're removed from the cell. But, but uh, uh, it, it turns out that if this su surveillance system breaks down through mutation of, of particular proteins, then the bad mitochondria will accumulate, and this appears to be part of the etiology of familial uh, Parkinson's disease. Now, whether this is true of sporadic Parkinson's uh, remain, remains to be seen. So there is, there is uh, the beginnings of understanding of one of these, uh, uh, but just to take one example of one of these neurodegenerative diseases. And just to emphasize that the problems with Alzheimer's dementia and Alzheimer's have overtaken heart disease, the biggest cause of death for women, accounting for more than 13% uh, last year. That's 2014. And they're now the second biggest cause of death uh, in men. Well, I, I can't talk more about that uh, this morning for lack of time, but I want to talk a little bit about new antibiotics, and that's partly because my origins were in a laboratory in Oxford where the Kephalosporin antibiotics were discovered. Now, the, the, the first anti so the antibiotic era in this picture started in, in 1929. That, of course, is when Fleming made his original observation uh, about, um, uh, about a mold landing on his plate of Staphylococcus. Uh, Fleming did nothing to translate his, uh, nothing significant to translate his observation. It remained fallow in the literature for 10 years. And it was only in 1938 or 39 that Howard Florey and Ernst Chain at the University of Oxford saw this paper that Fleming had published and decided to try and do something about it. Their efforts and those of their colleagues were heroic during the wartime period, and that led to the use, clinical use of penicillin in, by 1943, and it was actually Fleming, uh, Flory went to the battlefields in North Africa and injected uh, servicemen with penicillin. And many people think that this was a major contribution towards the, uh, towards the war effort. Now, the, the antibiotics in general are targeted against different parts of the uh, bacterial cell, against cell wall synthesis, and that's true of both penicillins and, and cephalosporins. Other ones are, are directed against the structure of the cytoplasmic membrane. Many of them are involved in aspects of protein synthesis and DNA metabolism. Now, the problem that we're facing is that uh, there is extensive resistance, as you're well aware, to all of the antibiotics on this uh, particular slide. And uh, antibiotic resistance was observed from the moment that antibiotics were introduced. And so, if you again look at penicillin, it was deployed in 1943. And by uh, 1946, there were clinical isolates of penicillin resistance. Uh, my own DPhil supervisor, Edward Abraham, told me that even in 1943, he had uh, isolated strains of bacteria that were resistant uh, to penicillin. So that was even before it was uh, deployed um, in uh, uh, a, a, clinic, a clinical setting. And so this is true of all of these anti antibiotics. No sooner are they introduced than within a few years, uh, clinical resistance becomes uh, a problem. And, of course, we're well aware that part of, the, uh, part of the problem here has been the misuse of antibiotics by farmers shoveling large, large amounts, tons of antibiotics in, in, into the farming system, um, not to cure disease, but to make the, keep the animals healthy and give higher, higher yields. Um, now, I want to talk for a few months about tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is becoming a major problem again. So it's a, it, it's a disease of the respiratory system. It can spread to the brain, kidneys, and bones. It's highly contagious through coughing. Uh, symptoms are chest pain, fatigue, weight loss, and fever. And two billion people are now infected worldwide, and two million uh, die an annually. And of those that are untreated, 60% uh, will die. Um, and why is there a resurgence of TB? One of them is poor adherence to TB control programs. In order to uh, be cured of TB, you need to have a sustained uh, program uh, of, of drug treatment. And uh, many, of the, many of the people who have TB are, are in uh, poorer parts of the world, and they, fi they find it difficult 
to, 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 to maintain uh, that program of treatment. So drug resistance, multiple drug resistance, extreme drug resistance uh, have emerged amongst mycobacteria. And there is a widespread synergy with, with HIV as well. Now the problem is there's no quick and accurate diagnostics and there's no doubt that the drugs and the vaccines are way out of date. Uh, so we need new drugs against novel targets, not the, not the traditional targets I just briefly discussed. We need better vaccines, so BCG, uh, was introduced in 1921. People of my generation were injected uh, with BCG to prevent us getting uh, tuberculosis, and we need better methods of diagnosis. Now, the, the only drug to be introduced in the last 40 years to combat uh, tuberculosis is called bedaquiline. It's a, it's a quinolone uh, derivative. There's a structure, and it, it turns out that it, it inhibits the enzyme that I've worked on for the past 30 years, namely the ATP synthase. So this is a drug that's selective. It has no effect on the human ATP synthase in, in, in your mitochondria, but it inhibits the ATP synthase in the bacteria. Of course, there are differences in structure and function uh, between the human and bacterial forms that allow uh, the, 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 the development of a, of a specific antibiotic like this. And actually what it's doing is to bind here to the, what is called the rotor of the enzyme. So this is the ATPase that I've, I've worked on and established this structure. It has a rotary action that's driven by a voltage across this membrane that's generated from oxidation of sugars and fats. This rotor is going around at about 200 hertz and it's, it's, uh, this machine is spewing out huge amounts of ATP every day. You make about 50 kilograms of ATP in your mitochondria to sustain yourself every, every day. So the, the bedaquilin is interacting with the ring here and preventing rotation in the bacterial enzyme. And so we've determined the structure of the catalytic part with the aim now of starting to do structure-based drug design to make other new antibiotics that can be used to combat uh, tuberculosis. So this is my current, uh, current uh, focus for translation. Let me come to the energy crisis because this is another major crisis that's, that's confronting uh, your generation. So the, the huge amounts of energy hit the earth every day from, from the sun and by the process of photosynthesis, water is split into oxygen and uh, produces reducing equivalents. Um, this, of course, is required for life. This is the source of oxygen on Earth, and the, the reducing equivalents participate in what are called the dark reactions. So carbon dioxide is fixed in these reactions, and this is how high-energy organic uh, compounds, sugars and fats, uh, are generated. And this produces the biomass and food and, and is the origin of fossil fuels. And, uh, and then the oxygen is, is, uh, is, is consumed in the process of metabolizing the, uh, uh, the organic molecules we eat, the organic molecules, high energy on, uh, uh, organic molecules. We need oxygen to break them down back uh, to water. And everything was in balance until man came along. So the perfect solution was undermined by human invention. We've now had a world uh, that's seriously out of balance because we're digging up fossil fuels combusting them, combining them with oxygen and generating carbon dioxide. Now this, this graph shows the inexorable rise of carbon dioxide uh, in the atmosphere. It goes up to 2004 here, but it, it's continued since. Uh, this this uh, sawtooth uh, uh, depiction uh, results from the, the, the differences between summer and winter. So in winter, we accumulate more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh, when the stronger light returns, photosynthesis then fixes more carbon dioxide and it goes down. But the general trend is upwards. And this is partly a consequence of the rise uh, in global population. So you can see the way that that's going up at a rate of 1 billion every 13 years. And it's compounded by uh, another problem that's depicted here. So this is what's called the human 
Development Index, that, that described by the United Nations, which includes life expectancy, literacy, school enrollment, and GDP. So uh, as um, this index increases, then so does the uh, consumption of energy. So the, the USA is here, Iceland is way out here, the UK is here, and of course India and China are moving uh, towards the right at, at quite a rate of progress. So, so this compounds the problem. Um, uh, <coughs> this is, at the moment, uh, we consume 15 terawatts of energy, and that's the equivalent of 150 billion 100 watt light bulbs burning continuously. Uh, the United States takes 3.5 of those terawatts, and by 2050, the demand for uh, energy will have doubled uh, to 30 terawatts. And currently, 85% of the energy we use comes from, from fossil fuels. And clearly, that, that has to change. Now, th these are the potential sources of energy. Hydro is really quite low. Um, we're not going to solve our problems with hydro tides and wind, although they can make uh, significant contributions. Here is solar, it's massive. <coughs> this, uh, here's current use, the 15 terawatts going up, up, to, up to 30. Nuclear is interesting. I've actually changed my views over the past year or two uh, on nuclear. I mean, clearly conventional reactors have got many problems that we're well aware of from uh, events in Fukushima, for example. Uh, but I've recently been in India where they have decided to use fast breeder reactors and they're clean. And the fuel that they use, thorium, is abundant, at least uh, in India. So I think this is, at least for India and possibly for other uh, major nations, uh, is a, a viable source of energy, at least in the interim, whilst we can get our act together and develop better ways of harvesting and using solar. Uh, energy. Of course, fusion, fusion reactors have been long discussed for, since I was a, a student as a potential way of solving this energy uh, problem by mimicking uh, the physics of the sun. It clearly has huge potential, but it also has huge practical problems that are still not overcome. So every time I talk to physicists who work in this area, they say 20 years, or 20 years ago, they said 20 years, so it's still 20 years. So th th they've still got massive uh, problems that they need to overcome, but no doubt progress is being made. So this is the, this is the good news here. Uh, so the, the, the sun is a nuclear fusion reactor. And one hour of sunlight equals the annual consumption, uh, annual global energy consumption. So planet Earth is energy rich. And so I, I personally think that entering this field and trying to solve this problem is a really huge and major challenging problem, and it's one that would certainly excite me uh, at your stage uh, of development. And there's, there's potential not only for fundamental discovery, but also for translation and generation of, of wealth. So I just wanted to finish with a few comments on innovation that I find. So Thomas Edison said, we don't know a millionth of 1% about anything. And William Blake said, what is now proved was once only imagined. Churchill said, no idea is so outlandish that it should not be considered. And Einstein said, you can't solve a problem on the same level that it was created. You have to rise above it to the next level. And William Cameron, who was an advisor of, of uh, Henry Ford, said, money never starts an idea. It's the idea that starts the money. So on that note, I finish, and thank you very much. So Batten disease is a, um, a rare disease. It affects about one in 10,000. Um, it's an autosomal recessive disease. It affects uh, mainly uh, small children. Uh, they often will die in their, in their first decade, and they have severe uh, neurodegeneration neuro de problems. And the reason I'm 
interested in it. It was brought to, to my attention by a New Zealand scientist with whom I've collaborated for the past 20 years, but it turns out that one of, one of the associated symptoms of Batten disease is that in, in all tissues, lysosomes accumulate a protein. So it is actually a lysosomal proteinosis. So we're familiar with other lysosomal storage diseases, storage of lipids, for example, but this is a, a protein has been stored in the lysosomes. And what is the protein? The protein is the rotor protein from the ATP synthase. And uh, I've looked at it, and it's completely normal. It's, ab it's absolutely identical to, 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 to the normal rotor protein. And uh, uh, the, although there, there are human mutations and the genes have been identified, um, the genes are known, the, the functions of the genes have not been identified, but I think what they probably will be part of is some pathway uh, that is responsible for the degradation of what is probably the most hydrophobic protein in the body. So that's the reason for my interest in Batten disease. Whilst you're passing the microphone around, I have an advertisement because I have an association with a Swiss organization called STARS, and they're trying to develop leaders for the next generation. They've been carrying out, uh, giving conferences since 2000, holding conferences for 2008. They're based in Stein am Rhein in, in Switzerland. They're funded by many of your funders, plus the Union Bank de Suisse, and uh, this year they'll organize three conferences, one already taking place in Singapore, one about to be, take place in China, and another one later in the year in Stein am Rhein. And I, I, I'm bringing this to your, your attention because I think it is something that is probably of interest to many of you. It's targeted not at, at people at your stage of development, but at the, next, at the next stage, but you should bear it in mind as something to be interested in uh, in, 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 in the future, right? Thank you. Um, thank you for a very interesting um, uh, to, uh, lecture. I have a question about the, the tuberculosis, the, the treatments, and the poor adherence amongst patients who are taking it. Uh, and you, you, you indicated that, uh, you know, it's usually very poor because, you know, there's low adherence because the peop you know, people who are taking this or who are most affected by, by, by tuberculosis are usually in resource-limited settings. And I just wondered whether, you know, there, there is any, if you could shed, shed some more light uh, on the adherence of, of, of treatment yeah. by people who are in, you know, maybe of higher economic status compared to people who are in resource-limited status. Uh, re remote resource limited settings and and also whether this problem might be impacted upon by the toxicity of the drugs you know does that also affect how well patients tend to stay on treatment and follow the cross to, to the end and the reason the reason that one requires a long regime of treatment for tuberculosis is that the mycobacterium has two forms. It has a, an active uh, form where it's metabolizing. That's quite easy uh, to hit and to kill. But unfortunately, there's a cryptic form that lives within uh, cells. It's not actually uh, totally quiescent and cryptic. It's actually metabolizing slowly, uh, but not dividing. And unless one, one kills this cryptic form as well, then you can kill off the actively dividing bacteria but the, the, the disease will then re-emerge when the cryptic form, as it were, wake, wakens up. And so that, that's the problem. And this drug, bedacrolin, actually is rare amongst drugs against uh, tuberculosis insofar as it will kill the cryptic form uh, as well. But in order to do that, you have to, to persist with a long regime of, of drug taking over a period, I'm told, of months. So, so that's, the, that's the basis of the, of, of the problem. Yeah. Well, 
I mean, Bedakulin is a very, very good example. So you know, it is presented as though it's black and white. Uh, it affects the, the, the bacterial ATPase, but doesn't affect the human ATPase. Actually, there are effects on the human ATPase, but they're minor. But, but these people are in such a desperate state of health uh, that, it, that, that the, the clinicians go ahead and they use the drugs because they can derive a beneficial effect. Uh, whilst at the same time acknowledging that there are side effects. So none of these drugs are perfect. Um, good morning. My name is Robbie. I'm a PhD student at Oxford University. Thank you for your talk. Um, I was wondering if you had any advice as to where to... Um, I should direct my attention if I want to make the greatest contribution I can to helping solve some of the problems that we face. So should I focus on a basic science a research question, a fundamental question, and if, if ever there's um, a potential application, I should leap on that. Or should I start from the outset trying to solve one of these problems using the technology that's available? Do you have any advice on that? I, I think you have to do what, whatever drives you. Um, it, I mean, it's very important, and other people have said this, I'm told, at this conference, uh, that, that the motivation has to come from within you. And so you have to work on what you, what inspires you, what you think is important. And if, if you have that desire to solve that problem, then it, it, if, of course you, you, need, you need all kinds of other qualities. You need, you need stamina, definitely, to solve these, these major problems. But I think it's very important that you do what you think is important, not what someone else thinks is important. Good morning, I am Charles Jordan Reyes. I am a master course student in Japan. I am also interested in neurodegenerative diseases. So you mentioned that majority of the cases of Parkinson's disease are sporadic cases. So how do you devise a strategy to understand the mechanisms of these sporadic cases, given that there are no genetic aberrations found in the patients? Thank you. There are experts in this field that argue that uh, findings with the familial forms of Parkinson's disease uh, are irrelevant to the sporadic forms, and the, the, the familial and sporadic forms are two different diseases, and that, that may well be true. So I think that we're just at the beginning of, of, of understanding of how uh, the etiology of Parkinson's disease uh, may emerge. Undoubtedly, there are environmental factors that, that are involved, and there, there are very, there's a very well-known case in uh, the Bay Area of San Francisco where people were taking designer drugs and it turned out that the, the, the designer drugs were contaminated with a compound which, when metabolized in the body, uh, then led uh, to the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And there's a kind of outbreak of Parkinson's disease amongst these drug takers in the uh, late uh, 1980s. And it, again, it, it, it turned out to be something that was interfering directly uh, with oxidative metabolism in mitochondria. So this is another indication that if you mess up the mitochondria, then this may lead to some, uh, uh, may lead to the, uh, uh, may lead to Parkinsonism or Parkinson's disease. I think we will unfortunately have to wrap up now. We're running to the okay. time. But thank you so much, Professor Walter. For Thanks, your pleasure. <laughs>